Hi everyone. <clears throat> Today I'm going to continue with the Angular examples. So on the, on this uh, GitHub repository, I have the link to the YouTube video and a link to the examples. So I'll just start off where I left off before. I think I got to example 36. But let's start with example 34 because that's really where the routing part starts and I want to cover this from the beginning. So routing means like Angular helps you deal with changes in the URL after the hash symbol. So it doesn't it doesn't refresh the page but it might cause change in behavior. So um, I, I drew this a lot from step seven of the official Angular tutorial and it's really good. I recommend you check this out. It's linked there from the example page. And the documentation is really nice too. There's this module called Route Provider that comes in a separate script. Um, and this is how you use it. Win path route. So path is the part of the URL after the hash. And route is it's some object where you can configure what the route does. So here's the basic boilerplate for including routing in the app. You have this Angular route script and when you define the angular module for your app you you put ng route in this array of dependencies so this tells angular that your module will need to access this other module ng route which provides the routing so This ng route module is, is what allows you to declare this dependency here, route provider. So remember, when you call these functions on the app module, you pass a function whose arguments are actually the dependencies. So you're declaring your dependencies with these arguments. And depending on what the argument name is, Angular passes in a different thing. So this is one tricky thing about Angular, the dependency injection part. So here we're calling config on the app module. Config is something where <clears throat> it just runs this function once in the beginning when the app loads. So this configures the routes. So when slash, this means when the URL ends in uh, hash symbol slash, it does this. Uh, we give it the template, which is the HTML template, which includes Angular code. So this gets evaluated and compiled uh, by Angular. So this is from a previous example. It's just a list of all the countries. It's just a list of the country names for all the countries that we have in the countries object, which we're fetching from the JSON file from last time. And we're declaring that the controller used for this template is this country list CTRL which is defined down here, which fetches the JSON file and sets the countries object on the scope to the data from the JSON file. So this scope here is associated with this template here and not the other template. That's why you need to define the country list controller uh, name here. So this other route says when the URL ends in hash symbol slash some string could be any string. Um, this syntax, this colon, means that this thing is like a variable uh, that you can access later on. It's a part of the URL. And this syntax actually comes from Express, which is a node project for uh, serving websites. And I think it has some other history, I don't know. But uh, anyway, it means that this is a route param, a route parameter that gets passed in to your controller. You can access it in the controller. So the template is just a just a placeholder. It says like to do create this page. And the controller is set to the country detail controller. And in this country detail controller, we're requesting the scope and route params. So route params is being printed out to the console when this page loads. So Let's run it full screen and see what that evaluates to. 
So when I click this, it's running full screen here. Um, let me get out of the full screen Chrome. There we go. So when I load this example 34 full screen, you see that the URL ends in hash slash. So that means that this route here is the thing that's evaluated. So therefore, it fetches the JSON and renders each uh, country name. So let's test out this other route, slash country name. So what I'm going to do is copy, say, China, and put it after the slash in the URL, and then hit Enter. The page doesn't reload, but it triggers Angular to render this other template, to do create country detail view, which is this template here. So this, this uh, route is configured with this controller, which outputs the route params object to the console. So let's check out the console and see what's been printed. OK, it's an object where country name is China. So <coughs> the name of this property comes from this syntax here when you define the routes. So when you, when you prefix something with a colon, it means that this will be the name of the property on the route params object that gets set to the part of the URL that goes in that placeholder. So here the value is China, and we get China out. Are there any questions? So here's the next example, example 35. So before, the, the template was a string in the actual page. But now we're, we're using this other configuration parameter, template URL, which will cause Angular to fetch the template from a file. So now the templates are in separate files. So the template for the root is country list.html, which is right here. It's just the same as it was before, but separated into a different file. And the same thing for the country detail template. It's been extracted into a separate file. So this is how you can put templates in separate HTML files, which is typically what you want to do, because they're usually large templates. Everything else is the same. So example 36. So remember, we had this route params country name property that we could access. So now <clears throat> this code is setting the country name to the name property on the scope for this controller. And in the country detail view template, it's accessing that property name using the handlebar syntax. So what will this do? If I go to this hash slash China page on, this, on example 36, what will be rendered? The name of the country. Yeah, right. So the country name is being extracted from the route params and set to the model that this template is using. And then this template accesses the name property of the model. So therefore, it'll, it'll be an H1 tag where the text is China. So let's test it out. If I run this full screen and then change the end of the URL to be hash slash China, it will render China. So this is how you can extract things from the URL and then use them in the template for that page. So let's say that we want to have this index, this listing of all the countries be clickable. So you can click the name of each country and that will you know, redirect you to the page for that country. So now if I click China, it, it goes to that page for China. And if I click India, it goes to, goes to that page for India. So let's see how this is done. In the country list template, we're repeating over the countries and an ahref has been added here. So it's a link. And the link goes to hash slash country.name. 
and country is in this repeater. So it gets evaluated to each unique country in the list. So it's country name as the text, which is this text you see here. And then if, if I inspect this element here for China, we can see that it's ahref hash slash China. So if I click that, I'll run it full screen so you can see the URL. If I click on China, it just changes the end of the URL here. And it again, it doesn't reload the page, but Angular detects this change and then renders the view for that country page. So this is how you can link to, uh, this is how you can do navigation between these pages using routes. So let's say that we want to expand each country page. So instead of just having the name of the country in the, you know, as an H1 thing on the top of the page, it will display some more information about that country. So right now, when you click on the page for China, it just renders China, right? But what we'd want to do is have like a profile page for China and have like some information like what is the population of the country and maybe display the flag for the, for the country. So how would we do this? we need to access the same data that's in the JSON file that was accessed by the other controller. So this controller fetches the JSON data and lists the countries. And in the detailed view, we want to access that same data and then display it, maybe in a bulleted list, say. So let's think about how can we do that. Well, right now we're fetching the JSON data within that controller. And that's kind of all we know how to do right now. So with this machinery that we're familiar with already, let's try to implement this new idea. So example 38. So in the detail controller, let's fetch the JSON data again. And this is redundant. We're fetching it mul multiple times. And later on, I'll show you how to only fetch it once and cache the result. But this is sort of the path to get there. So we fetch the data. We can call data.filter. So data is an array, and filter is just a function that's on the native JavaScript arrays. <coughs> if you don't know about the filter function, it, it, it's, a, it's like a functional programming thing for working with arrays. It lets you filter out certain values that, path a that pass a truth test. So the function you give it is called for each entry in the array, and then it returns a Boolean. And if it returns true, that entry is included in the filtered list. And if it returns false, then that entry is not included in the filtered list. So the test here is, is the entry equivalent to the name on the scope? And name is assigned from the route params. So this is doing a linear search through the data to find that country by name. And then it's assigning it to the country variable. And then we're printing it out to the console. So let's see if this worked. So I'll run it full screen, open the console. If I click on China, it outputs this object, which is the object from the JSON data that corresponds to that country. So the filter code worked correctly. So now let's go about using this data in the page and displaying some more information about you know, China or India or whatever country you click on. So here's how you surface that data. So now if I click on China, it shows me the flag, the population, the capital, and the GDP, which is just all from the data. So let's see how this works. So the filtering code is the same. It filters and it gets the first element in the array because the array only contains one thing and it just gets that element out and it sets that element element to the scope property country on the, on the model. So now the template for the country detail page has access to this value, country. And let's see how it's used. The country detail view now is uh, more full. So it has h1 country.name and then just some simple HTML. It's a, it's a ULLI thing, so it's a bulleted list where the flag is an image with ng source as the flag URL and a width of 100 just because the original flags are huge. Just want to make them small. And I don't think you need the closing tag for images. Do you guys know about that? 
Okay. So that was my bad. So that's why I was giving errors. But. So it's population, and then we can inject the country population using the number filter, just like we did before. And we can, we can insert the country capital and the country GDP using the currency filter, just like we did before. So remember that table example. Let me just show you again the table example. So we had this table example where we, we added the filter to show it as currency. This one here, pipe currency. So remember, this is an angular filter that formats things as currency. And then we used this other one number to display population with commas. So here population is using the number filter. So we're using those filters again in this example on the detail page to surface this data. So this is how you can put data in the, in the view for a particular country and display it to the user. So what what could be improved about this, the way it's implemented here? It's kind of doing something a little bit redundant. Yeah, you can cache the JSON. So this, it's getting the JSON for each view separately. So this means that each time so let's look at the page. This means that each time we click on China, it fetches the JSON file. So we can actually look at the network tab and see what's going on. Let's refresh the page. So here it fetched countries.json, and then when I click on China, we can see it fetched the JSON data again. And then we, when we go back to the index page, it fetches the JSON data again. So each time we change the view, it fetches the JSON data over and over and over. So ideally it would just fetch it once and cache the result on the client. So let's see, how can we do this? And <clears throat> it took me a while to figure it out. And you actually need to use another Angular feature called a factory. An Angular factory lets you create a service that you can use with Angular's dependency injection. So this is the recommended way of exposing data from a server to views in an Angular app. So example 40, let's add this service that fetches the JSON data. So what I've done here is called country app dot factory. So country app is the Angular module for our app and we can call factory on it. The first argument to factory is the name of this service that can be used later to look it up and then the implementation of it. So here we're requesting the HTTP module based on its argument name. And we're returning an object that has a function on it called list. So list, it means like, you know, list the countries for me. And it takes a callback function that will be called with the data when the data is loaded. And we just say http.get countries.json success, and we pass the callback function that was passed in. So previ the previous example, when we call http.get countries.json.success, we pass in a function that accepts data as an argument. So here we are sort of <coughs> introducing another level of indirection where we're letting <coughs> We're letting the controllers call this list function and, and pass their own callback. So here we're just introducing a factory called countries. And check out these controllers. In the definition of the controllers, we're requesting scope, HTTP, and countries. So we're just using the name of our factory as a, as a function parameter here. So this is using Angular's dependency injection. And this is how we can actually use Angular's dependency injection ourselves. We can create our own things that will be injected into controllers or other services. So we get this country's object, which is the thing that was returned here. So we can call countries.list, which calls this function. And we pass it a function, the callback, 
that will be called with countries, which is the JSON data, once it's loaded, and then we just assign scope.countries to be countries. So the previous example calls HTTP, calls HTTP here and then sets scope.countries equals data. And this next example does the same thing, but now it's just using a service that we've defined. So on the next example, <coughs> the country detail view is also updated to use the service. So we're injecting our countries service, calling countries.find. And so now a find function has been introduced. And this find function gets the details for one country. So it's still doing the redundant fetching of the JSON, but now it's all in one place. So now we're in a position to refactor it. But let's just take a look at this find function. It's doing the same thing as it was doing before, but now it's encapsulated in a function. So it gets the JSON data. It filters by the country name, which is an argument now to the find function. And then it calls the callback with this one country. So the country detail view calls find, passes in the country name from the route parents as the name of the country. And then it passes a callback that will be called with the data for that particular country only. And then it says scope.country equals country, same as before. So the templates haven't changed. It's just been, the page has been refactored now to use a service or factory to fetch and filter the JSON data. So the behavior is the same. If I click China, I get the page for China. And if I click India, I get the page for India. So now let's do the caching. Now that all the fetches are in one place, we can, we can cache them. So here some JavaScript code has been written that implements caching in a simple way. So we have the cached data, which originally is null. And there's this function get data, which takes as an argument a callback. So it's basically the list function from before. So this is the, co the code from before, but now after it fetches the JSON data, it will set the cached data to the, to the fetched data and then call the callback with the data. So if this code path already executed, cached data is no longer null. So when we call the get data function after the data has already been loaded, it checks to see, is the, has the data already been loaded and cached? Then if it has, call, call the callback right away with the cached data and don't fetch the JSON. So this get data function is like a list function with caching implemented. So when we return the object that has the methods that can be called by the controllers, uh, list is just get data, and find is now a function with a name and a callback, and we use, instead of HTTP get, we use the get data function, which has the caching. And the filtering code is, is the same as it was before. So let's test it out. Let's, so I'm going to run this example full screen and open up the network tab of the Chrome DevTools. So I'll refresh the page. I've, it's fetched the country's JSON file. And now if I click on China, it fetched the flag, but it did not fetch the country's JSON again. See, it's only there once in the list of files that have been fetched. So it worked. So now this, this page is like implemented in a reasonable way. It fetches the JSON data once, and that's it. So this is how you cache data that's been fetched by a server using an Angular factory. Or they call it a service. I don't know why it's factory. This, you know, but that's life. If you look at the Angular documentation on the HTTP service, there's actually a cache option built into the HTTP call. So <clears throat> Example 42, the previous example, we implemented caching ourselves. And you might want to do this if some kind of pre-processing needs to be done on the data. 
before it gets used. So when you get the data, you could like preprocess the data, which might like add some things or compute some things and set them on the data. But if you don't need to do that, uh, you can simplify this code by just using the cache option on the Angular HTTP module. So here's how you do it. You call HTTP with these options. You say the method, the HTTP method will be get, the URL will be countries.json, and set cache to be true. And all the other code is the same. But now this get, get data function is just implemented with the HTTP module from Angular. So let's test this again to see if it's working properly. Refresh the page. In the network tab, countries.json was loaded in the beginning. If I click on China, it doesn't load the countries.json file. So it worked. So this is how you can cache data with the HTTP module of Angular. So check out this little bug. If I go to India or China, I go back, it's been visited. Actually, let me open this up in a stealth mode Chrome. Or actually, I don't know if this will work. No, it doesn't keep track of your visited views. But uh, So if I click on China and I go back, China's been visited. And since I clicked India before, it has that visited color of those links. But if, if I click on the United States of America and then I go back, the browser tells me that this link has not been visited. So this kind of threw me for a loop when I saw it. I'm like, oh, this is a good test of like, well, how can Angular help solve this thing? So I realized what was happening was when you click on this, um, it has to do with this replacing the spaces with the percent %20 in the URL. If we look at the HTML, we inspect the element here. The a href is set to uh, hash slash United States of America with space characters. There are space characters there, not those uh, percent twenty things that you should have in URLs. So I figured one way to solve this problem would be to make the a href contain those URL escaped uh, characters for space, the percent twenty things. So I figured, well, one way to do this would be to use a filter. So I looked in the Angular docs for filters for encoding URIs, and there was none. So I figured, okay, I'll, I'll try implementing my own filter rather than just using the Angular filters that are there. So now I'm going to talk about how to in implement your own Angular filter. So here's the thing that defines the filter encode URI. And it just returns window.encode URI, which is a built-in function in the browser that encodes a URI based on a string. So if I call encode URI with hello space world, see it replaces that space with a percent %20. So now that I've got that custom filter, and it's called encode URI, it can be used in the template. So here it is. It's the ahref, <coughs> the link, is now set to country name pipe, and pipe is the character you use for Angular filters, encode URI. So this is, this is how you can actually use your own custom filters in Angular. And once you add the filter to your app module, you can use this in any Angular expression, which is pretty powerful. So now if we look at this example full screen and we inspect this element, the ahref contains these percent %20 things rather than spaces. So this means that now, see that's China's been visited, but now if we click on the US and then go back, the browser caught the fact that it's been visited. This is because the URLs actually match the ahref URL. So this is how you can create custom filters to encode URLs. Uh, but you can 
you can encode, you can, you can create custom filters that do just about anything. You just have to return a function that takes as input some string and it returns some other string. In the real world, uh, in, if you're building an app, say like a blog, or something like that, you know, in a way this little application is similar to a blog in that you have a listing in the front and if you click on each thing in the listing, it fetches more details about that entry. So let's say this were stored in a database and the HTTP requests that go to the server would be different based on if it's the listing or if it's the detailed view. So the, the request for the listing might only return the names of the countries and not all the data for each country. And if you click on the country, the HTTP request would have in it the country name and, it would, and the server would return some data about that country. And maybe this data would come from a database by querying the database with the name. So let's start refactoring our code to, to try simulating this. Um, and by the way, it's called a RESTful service. When there's a server-side API that takes HTTP requests and gives back some data, uh, RESTful stands for representation, representational state transfer. And this is kind of a best practice for implementing server-side APIs uh, today. It's got all these great uh, architectural properties like it's cacheable and so on. So it's worth reading about. It's based on using HTTP to get, put, post, and delete uh, various entities in a database. So let's let's see what what has changed here. So check this out. Now there's a countries.json file that only contains the names for the countries and an ID for each country. So this is simulating a database that has IDs for each country. And then there are these other files, country underscore one dot JSON. This is simulating a database query where you give it the ID of one and it returns this object that has information about that particular country. So country two is India, country three is the US. So let's see how the code needs to change to reflect this. Notice how the controller code <coughs> has, has not changed at all. The controller code has not changed at all because we've encapsulated the fetching of data from the server into this country's service. This is one advantage of using your own services rather than putting the fetching code inside the controller. So here's the country's service that gets the data. The list function is now an HTTP call that fetches the JSON data using caching. So it's the same as it was before, but now it's just been put inside the list function. And the find function is really what has changed. The find function no longer does a linear search through the list of country data. Instead, what it does is it fetches a file that is country underscore an ID and the ID is the argument here to the function. Oh actually this controller did change a little bit. Um, now we have route params dot country ID. So that's because in the in the country list template instead of uh, linking to hash slash the country name now we're going to use the country ID instead. So this country list has actually changed to use country.id rather than country.name. So it's still displaying the country name, but in the link, it's pointing to the country ID. <coughs> so if we run the example full screen and we inspect the element for, for one of these, like the US, inspect element, we can see that the text is the text of it is the United States of America, but the href part is hash slash three. So if we click that, the URL changes to hash slash three, which triggers this route, 
which has been changed to include the country ID rather than the country name. And it's still called the country detail view. So the country detail controller, it calls country.find with the country ID and it, it's returned the country data, which is set to the country value on the scope, same as before. But now it just fetches a file where the name is dynamically computed based on the ID. So this kind of simulates querying a database based on an ID. I wanted to introduce the idea of creating your own Angular directive. So these things that you see in the tags like ng app and ng source and ng repeat, these are all Angular directives. And people have said this is the most powerful feature of Angular because it essentially lets you define your own HTML tags in a way. In a way, it lets you define new HTML tags that have custom behavior based on JavaScript. So some people have called Angular HTML6 for this reason, because it lets you basically define your own HTML tags that have their own custom behavior based on JavaScript that you write. But it's a little heady to try to start doing it. And um, it, it's kind of a hairy part of Angular. Like, it's not as straightforward as some other parts, but it may be because it's such a powerful feature. So let's just take a look at these uh, articles that I've used to figure out how to do it. So NG Newsletter is this nice blog that has posts about Angular, and here's one about building directives. So this is a great read. This is a very clear explanation of how to create directives. And there's tons and tons of videos on YouTube. Like if you just search YouTube for Angular directive creation, you'll get a lot of results. And this talk by Mishko Hevry is very clear. It's very good. Uh, he's the guy who started Angular. So I would recommend watching this if you really want to learn how to create your own directives for Angular. But let's see, here's the gist of it. You can use directives in a few different ways. A directive could be an attribute in the HTML tag. It could be a class a CSS class like this. It could be an element. So this is really like creating your own HTML tags, creating directives as elements. Or it could be as a comment. So a comment can trigger this behavior of a directive as well. So here's, here's an example where they build a directive for this little plot of weather for a particular place. So you call app.directive. App is an Angular module for the application. Dot directive, you give it the name and a function that returns these options for the directive. So the restrict option is A. And the restrict option can have these different values, A, E, C, and M. So A means attribute. The directive will be an attribute that you can use in the HTML tag. E means element. So the directive can be used like this, as the element, like as the HTML tag. C stands for class, uh, where the directive can be used as a class. And M stands for comment, where the directive can be triggered by a comment in the HTML. And you can combine them together. So like restrict AE, or EA, allows the directive to be used in both ways. So directives, kind of like uh, routes, can have templates that are evaluated <coughs> uh, when, when Angular renders that directive. So you can have a template property, or you can also have a template URL property, which will cause Angular to fetch that template from that URL. And there's a sort of deep and really well thought out way that, Angu that Angular directives are processed. And this is sort of what the article covers. 
uh, it's, it gets compiled and it gets instantiated. So there's a bootstrap process where they get compiled and linked. And uh, it's kind of a deep topic, but there are great articles online for learning about it. So what I did is kind of I learned the minimal that I needed to to get something working. And I made a directive for countries. So let's say that you want to have a listing of countries, but then each element in that list would have some associated behavior like fetching the JSON data for that particular country. And actually, as an aside, this example viewer is what caused me to, tr to have to figure this out. Because in this example viewer, which is an Angular app, all these files had to be loaded sort of separately, like index.html and country detail.html and country list.html. The way I did it in the example viewer is using a directive for loading each of these. I have a strange question. Is there a library that handles the formatting of these code blocks? Oh, yeah. It's a code mirror. Okay. Yeah, the question is, is there a library that does the syntax highlighting and the formatting? It's called code mirror. It's a great library. It's fairly straightforward to use. You just create a <coughs> you create a text area on your page and then call this function after including the code mirror library and it, it sets up the syntax highlighted thing. It's really great, really useful. And you can you can type in here too, and it's really nice for editing code. I think JSBin is implemented using code mirror. So let's check out this country directive. So here it is. Here's the definition of my custom directive. I'm going to call it country. Restrict will be A, so I'll use this as an attribute in a tag. And the template URL will be country.html. And scope. Oh, so scope is another kind of tricky thing. Let's come back to this when we see how it's used. So here's the template, country.html. Here's the template for our directive. It's just a link to the country ID and the country name. It's just sort of the same as what the template was doing before, but now it's encapsulated into a directive. And here's the country list template. Here's how it's changed. It's li, ng repeat, everything the same, but now we have this property, country equals country. So this country part, the first, one, the first part of this, tells Angular that this is using our directive called country. And the directives that come with Angular start with ng, but if you define your own directives, it's not, necessarily, not necessary to use ng. I kind of got lost. Um, here it is, country equals country. So on the right-hand side of this expression, it's saying country equals country. And this is resolving to country in countries. So for each country, this resolves to a different country, you know, the data for that particular country. So here, country Scope, country gets equals. Actually, let me see if I can find this in the documentation because it's really like a tricky, strange thing. So you can have various options on scope. And the equals sign, there should be a little place where all of this is explained. Yeah, so if you use the equals sign in scope, it's bidirectional binding. It means it sets up data binding between this local, prop, local scope property as in, it's a property on the scope that's local to this particular instance of the directive. Directives have their own scope. This is something you can configure also. But uh, with the way I've set this up, this directive has its own nested scope. So using this equals sign, it sets up a binding between the parent property and the local property. So that means that in, in this case, 
it takes the country that's evaluated here by this ng repeat, and it just passes it down into the local scope for this directive, for the country directive. That means that in the directive template, we can refer to country. So this is why we can access country. It's because of this scope declaration. And it works. So here we have our page, and it's the same as it was before. So now let's introduce some behavior, some asynchronous behavior to this directive. <coughs> so directives, just like uh, routes, can have their own controllers. So here I've just defined a controller that gets the scope and it injects the countries service that we created before and it just outputs the scope.country. It doesn't really do anything. So let's see this in action. So if I refresh the page, it outputs these three objects. So that means that the controller for the directive is getting called once for each country, which makes sense. You know, so for each time the directive is instantiated, it's, it's calling the controller. So we have the name and the ID of the country. And I don't know what this hash key is, something injected by Angular. It's a mysterious thing to me. You could look it up. So now that we have this controller, we can put some behavior in there that fetches the JSON data for that particular country. So what I want to do is I want to have this listing of countries and then have the flag displayed in the listing itself. So example 48 fetches the flags and puts them in the listing. So let's see what this looks like. In the controller for our country directive, we use our service, countries, we call country.find, scope.country.id, because we have this country from the listing. And then the callback is called with the country object that has all the data for this particular country. And then it sets the flag URL on the scope of the directive. So th this, this means that we can access flag URL in the directive template. So here in the directive template, we have an image tag. And again, we don't need to close the tag, something I forgot. We have an image tag in the country template for the directive. So ng source equals flag URL. And the width is 20 just to make it really small. So flag URL comes from the scope of the directive. So, and it's been assigned here after this call resolves. So if we load this page full screen and we look at the network tab of the Chrome DevTools, we refresh the page, we can see that first it fetched the countries.json file and then it actually fetched each country JSON file separately for each of the country directives. So this is how you can create your own Angular directive and have the directive do some asynchronous thing. It's, uh, it was hard for me to figure out, and that's how I implemented the example viewer. And while we're on that topic, let me just show you the example viewer. So here's the example viewer. It's in the GitHub repository for the talk. And example detail.html is this page here that renders each example. So if you want to kind of dig deeper into Angular, take a look at this source code. Might be interesting. So here, I'm using a custom directive called example. It's a text area. File equals file in the list of files for each example. And example equals example. So it, it invokes this custom directive called example. And here's the iframe where ng source is set to the URL for running the example. So actually, this is the entire HTML for the page that you're looking at, for this one. So I found it amazing that you could express something like this in such a small amount of code with Angular.
so let's take a look at, look at this example directive implementation. Um, where is it? So here's the app.js. I think it's in here. So the Okay, so it's the file directive. Let me really find it here. Yeah, so in the example detail page, it says file equals file, example equals example, and file is what's triggering the directive. And in app.js, here's the definition of the file directive. It gets the file and example values from the parent scope. And it computes the path of the file to load. And then it does an HTTP request for that file. And then set, it sets scope.content equals the content of that particular file. And then it's using the code mirror API to set the value of the code mirror editor to the content of that file when the thing is loaded. So I just wanted to show you how it was done. Um, yeah, that's how it works. So we're down to the last two examples. And these last two examples just show you how to separate things into many files. So right now, <coughs> There's one giant script tag that does everything. And here's how you can use Angular modules to decompose your app into different parts. So I've separated out into app.js. App.js is just loaded here. And countrycontrollers.js is another file. So let's see at countrycontrollers.js. It declares an Angular module called country controllers, and it adds the two controllers to this module. And in app.js, we say there's an Angular module, country app, it requires ng-route and country controllers, the module that we've created. So this is how you can use Angular's dependency injection at the module level to inject your own modules into other modules as dependencies. So this line causes country controllers, you know, all the controllers in that module to be sort of loaded into this app module as controllers also. And the last example, it just really separates out the factories and the directives and everything into separate modules. So here's app.js. It declares country controllers, country factories, country's factory, and country directive. They're all separate modules now. And in app.js, all it does is configure the routes. So here's country, countries factory.js. It declares a module called countries, called countries factory. And it changes the method, actually. So it, it defines the module. And rather than assigning it to a local variable and then calling that local variable dot factory, it just changed the methods here. So it creates the factory and then calls dot factory. Sorry, it creates the module with no dependencies and then it calls dot factory on that module, which puts a factory named countries into that module. And the implementation is the same as before. And a similar pattern is used for the directive. So that's how you separate your app into different files using Angular modules. So that's all 50 of the examples. You know, I'm done. So hope you enjoyed. <laughs> Thank you.